lecturing. Hello, my name is Aaron Jones. I'm an assistant professor here at the College of Architecture and Design, and it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce tonight's speaker, Jenny Wu. Here at COED, we offer degrees in architecture, interior architecture, industrial design, urban design, among others. Um, though I highlight these areas because they all resonate with Ms. Wu's diverse portfolio. Ms. Wu is a partner at the Los Angeles-based architecture firm Euler Wu Collaborative, which she founded in 2004 with Mr. Dwayne Euler. Um, this award-winning uh, practice produces work which spans and scale from stair pavilions at SciArc to high-rises in Taiwan to river bikeway and greenway project commissioned by the city of Los Angeles. Uh, their website, EulerWu.com, also includes a section called Misfits, project, uh, Projections, and Products, which I admire uh, right away, um, <clears throat> and includes, among other things, toys, furniture, and tree houses. In addition to this work, Ms. Wu founded Lace by Ginny Wu, a line of 3D printed luxury jewelry, which is very beautiful, uh, and maintains appointments both at SciArc and at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. I expect there's a lot uh, we can learn from Ms. Wu's accomplished practice. So join me in welcoming Ginny Wu. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, thank you for uh, having me here. Um, it's my first time in Detroit. Um, a little cold <laughs> as I move to the slide to talk about Los Angeles. <laughs> um, I, I always start my lecture by talking a little bit about LA uh, because it's uh, been the home to my practice, um, you know, and my teaching for the last, um, I guess now, four, 14 years. Um, and what I find is really, um, amazing about LA is that it's really a, 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 a nice uh, convergence of um, interesting kind of um, companies that are there, uh, especially with tech startups and entertainment. There's a really amazing group of um, um, experimental architects that teach there at SciArc and elsewhere. And also, we just have really amazing weather where we can kind of build a lot of stuff. So, um, so yeah, so LA has been a, a really great, uh, amazing hotbed for experimentation for us. And, and also as a, as a way for us to launch a practice that and I think if you had told me 14 years ago how I was going to launch my practice, I'm not sure I would have said, here is the path. But I'd like to kind of show you our path. Um, but before we get started, um, Aaron was mentioning the kind of scale of work that we, we work on. We really do um, a huge range of projects. And I think it's both by design and sometimes is by accident. So um, we, we've done everything from really large scale uh, buildings, infrastructure, all the way down to small things such as jewelry. <coughs> so just to run through a, a few of the things that we've been working on, uh, this is a, a, a bikeway, a uh, greenway for um, the LA River. If you didn't know, LA has a river. If you saw Terminator, there was this concrete, you know, thing where they were shooting. Yeah, that's the river. It's empty usually. Um, but we're trying to design uh, a continuous uh, greenway bikeway along the edge of the river. And it's about 20, 20 miles um, in the sections that we're working on. And uh, we've also started working on some um, all, uh, projects that weren't really projects that architects take on. Uh, this is, uh, we're designing a 2,000 linear feet of uh, retaining wall. It was a street that they're widening into a hillside. So at moments, it's about 60 feet tall of concrete and about 2,000 feet wide. And they said, you know, we're, we're not going to just build a concrete wall. Can you make it? better. And so we've working on this uh, screen system with this textured wall surface that we're it's currently in, um, in uh, design development. 
We've also uh, done uh, large buildings. This is something I will talk a little bit uh, later on, but this is a, a high rise in Taipei. It's 16 stories tall. Also, um, a commercial building, another commercial building in Taipei, which was sort of a hybrid between an installation and, and a building where we were able to incorporate both in, in the project. Uh, another project I'll talk later is uh, we also do interiors. This is a, um, a lab for 3D printing food. And um, we spent a lot of years, I would say the first 10 years, um, <coughs> doing a lot of installations. Uh, this was a installations we did, installation we did for the Beijing Biennale. Um, it's about four stories tall, made of uh, rope and steel. As we keep going down in the scale, we, we do do uh, tree houses. This one specifically is in our backyard. Um, and also kind of our uh, lunch, uh, we have lunch below that, and then people sometimes, our interns, take naps up there. It's quite nice. <laughs> um, as we keep going down in scale, we work on, um, so back to the tree house, we're actually working, because of that tree house, we're working on an entire sort of tree house, sort of resort hotel now uh, in upstate New York. And, uh, these are uh, meditation pods. Um, also something that um, was very unique, we're working with a company called Headspace. Um, and if you guys ever use their app, um, they're quite big. They have 30 million downloads by now. Um, and because of our work in designing these pods, now we're working with a second meditation pod company working on a sec, a, a, another iteration of um, the meditation pods. Um, and that is uh, going to launch next year. We're working on manufacturing of these pods now. And then down to the scale of furniture, we've also done quite a few um, custom design furnitures that sometimes we build ourselves, especially in our backyard. And this, a lot of these starts with um, some of the kind of research that's happening in the office and then then as they might apply into different scales, so in the furniture or in the buildings. And just a few words about um, lace. It's the 3D printing jewelry line I started about four years ago. I didn't set out to just like start a 3D printing jewelry company. It was um, I had an idea about uh, some of uh, pieces I wanted to design. And as a designer, you often look around and say, well, there's not anything out there quite like this. And so I started designing myself. And then at that time, being an architect, I know how to 3D print. But in retrospect, I really don't know how to 3D print. <laughs> um, but we started designing these pieces, and they're very kind of intricate. And 3D printing actually made a lot of sense, especially if you imagine these are kind of three layers of interlocking pieces, but it's completely printed in one, one, um, one pass. And there's no assembly um, involved. Um, and even so, once I started uh, prototyping in 3D printing, um, just working on different materials and realized I know so little about all the kind of various technologies of 3D printing. Um, and so I spent, well, I started wearing them out and people started wanting to buy it. And then finally at some point I said, okay, let's, let's, let's just see what happens. In retrospect, um, you know, four years later, I think if I knew how much work it was to do it in the beginning, maybe I might not do it now, but I think it's been a really nice challenge um, working in different industries and crossing over, but learning from one and applying to the other. So this is a piece that was just acquired by the LA County Museum of Art. Um, it's one of the fully 3D printed interlocking uh, steel uh, necklaces uh, we designed. And we also start working in precious metals. This is a, using a 3D printed wax that gets casted in uh, the different metals, silver, gold, platinum, and also working on some wedding rings, things like, and we're incorporating different um, uh, 
technologies like lab-grown diamonds and things like that into our collection. So. And so, uh, as mentioned before, um, you know, we, we really work on a range of projects, but we work on it in a way that um, have been consistent in how we work on it. So through drawings, through models, through uh, fabrication, even in the jewelry, that's how we test how things work. So I wanted to just touch a little bit on, on the, the way we work. Um, these are, um, uh, so drawings, uh, these are sketches by my partner, which I'll show a little bit more. Um, hand drawings, by the way. Um, and we work through a lot of, um, let's say, we're interested in working on technical drawings, but technical drawings are elevated. Um, and so all of these drawings um, start to take on its own kind of quality, and, um, but they're always a kind of uh, using uh, projective methods of, of representation. So this was for a project we did. It was a kind of ceiling um, installation and sometimes we work on drawings that are um, just ways of thinking about um, how things are put together um, and even really rethink how we produce fabrication um, drawings, like shop drawings. Sometimes we actually only make one single drawing for an entire um, fabrication and you know, it gets to be a really gross piece of paper, but, and then we work directly from the computer uh, in, in actual on, on site. So, um, and then we work on a lot of models. I, I think in the beginning we were really, um, especially working on really quick installation projects. Sometimes you want to understand how um, a project behaves. So like this was a staircase we did uh, at SciArc and we built many of these models and the way we worked on it with uh, a structural engineer was to actually, he would just at some point, it took so long for it to run the analysis that he was like pushing on it and be like, it's soft right there, you know. Um, and then we'll like some, once in a while work on these, we call these epic models, because these models took longer than the insulation to build. <laughs> uh, the actual streaming of this line took so long that uh, it was an ongoing thing that our interns had to take on. <laughs> But we also do it ourselves too. Um, speaking a little bit about um, you know just starting in an office, I mean, most of you at some point are going to practice, and maybe at some point you want to start your own office, and you, you really want to know like, how do I? I have an idea. How do I make it real? And I think that's one of the things. Like, this is our backyard, um, also our shop space, also our lunch space, and where our kids play. And we uh, replicated an entire uh, mezzanine of one of our projects and then built uh, one of the installation um, fully in the backyard. And you know, I think uh, at some point we, we stumbled upon this idea of fabrication and using, actually pushing the design into the fabrication uh, process. And I think it allowed us to really be much more fluid about, and then also realizing some things that we thought was gonna work, wasn't gonna work, and, and, and then we really learned through how to assemble things better because we do build them ourselves. So, for example, um, a lot of times people look at our work and they think we're trying to make a kind of, uh, a kind of formal gesture, or that actually a lot of times these are we're solving problems um, that we've encountered before. So um, we were tasked to design a, a pavilion and it was a pavilion that looked something like this, um, like that. And um, basically uh, it was for graduation at SciArc and SciArc is very strange. Our graduation is in September and not in you know June. And, uh, the director at the time was Eric Owen Moss, and he uh, said, I just want you to make sure a thousand people are shaded on you know, the first, second week of September. And so we said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll design a net, which does nothing to help with the shading. 
Um, but we realized like in, in order to design a net that's going to work as part of the canopy of this uh, pavilion, we looked at ways of, of um, knotting um, a net. So instead of making a fixed knot, we made um, a kind of uh, loose knot at every joint. This allows us to actually stretch the net as we built it on site. So and the way we learned to knit was actually we watch a YouTube videos of people knitting. And so our whole, we had a seminar and then our students were like knitting, you know, they had, they made these, instead of using the needles, they had this thing called a knitting Nancy and they were knitting kind of, and so they created these models and we learned how to, how they behave. And then, and in fact, at the end, we, uh, if you see, um, there's, uh, I don't know if you can, is my mouse showing? No. Um, the, the two kind of wooden things, there's about a 20 foot uh, loom that we built. And in fact, you were, we, we knitted the entire canopy in place. And then later on, we, uh, we figured out like we had to shape people. That was kind of the directive. And so instead of, but we didn't want to just drape it over the entire thing. So we hung it vertically, which then, I mean, generally you can see the people below were shaded. <laughs> um, it actually worked better because if you had just hung the, just, it was a very kind of lower ish um, sun angle, it would have not covered them. Every, you'll see every time someone's welding, that's my partner. the looms that we built. You'll see it's kind of theme. Um, so yeah, a, a few words about the, the videos. Um, another perk of being in LA, you know, there's a lot of people who think there are filmmakers and they are all really good filmmakers. And we've befriended um, um, many of them, but this specific uh, one, they were making uh, kind of videos for DJs and then they started uh, we actually work on it with 
um, we were work collaborating with an artist on another project and they were helping them and then when we saw the kind of videos they were making we thought what an amazing way to capture the spirit of the build and so um, now they're doing like huge productions but they still help us out with our, our, our small little built videos which is pretty amazing. Um, so a few years later, um, actually uh, two years later, there was actually two more, uh, one more version of that pavilion um, where we use that for graduation, but we turned everyone 180 degrees and then we designed a stage, a new stage. And then after two years, we thought, okay, well, this whole thing was supposed to only last for like a day, but you know, it was really designed for one day, but then it it was around for two, two years. And so um, it was looking a little bad and we thought, oh, let's just take it down. And then, so we asked the office, we're like, I think we should take it down. And so we took the fabric down and the fabric and the net down. And then we ran into Eric Omas in the street and then he's like, why did you take it down? And, and then, so we thought, it just died. Okay, anyway, so, um, so he asked us, he said, well, I had plans for it. And so basically uh, we have the 40th anniversary of CyArk and they uh, wanted to use that pavilion. So we said, okay, we'll redesign something, but we want it to be completely different and we wanted it to feel much more volumetric. So we had an idea of using fabric and you know, and these creating these sort of funnels. We wanted to use the existing structure. Um, but what you realize is if you ever uh, work on, if you ever try to make funnels, uh, if you look at the diagram on the, on the top, to make a funnel, basically you have to pattern uh, the fabric in a specific way, which would be really difficult to do uh, when you're working super fast and in the field. So what we thought is if you actually make length A, which is the perimeter of the top frame, same as the perimeter of the bottom uh, frame, which is length B, um, you actually don't have to pattern it. So you can just stretch and then cut it. So the, what we call it a splat shape, you know, it's kind of the Nickelodeon splat, it is actually something really functional to help us um, be able to uh, do this fairly quickly and then also added something to the design. So it's also like these kind of little things where people like think that it may be started as a formal move, but it's actually started because of our understanding of uh, kind of fabrication um, technique and method and then led to the design. So yeah, so this was the, the 40th um, anniversary of, of CIRC. So um, I'm going to talk a few, uh, a few minutes about the kind of trajectory of our work and the things that, you know, as you can see, the, the range, there's something that seems to be kind of we've been working on. And um, we're, we, over, over the last 10 years, we really believe as, as in being the kind of office that have a problem that we work on over a long period of time because we think that true innovation can only happen when you really intimately understand a, a topic. So, um, so as my, as my um, grad, graduate thesis project, I had this kind of obsession about lines and uh, my partner Dwayne also like, you know, he doodles these kind of line drawings. Um, and so we both, it was something that, that brought us together and we, we started thinking about the type of lines that we're interested. And it was never um, a kind of graphic 2D thing, but it was always a kind of three-dimensional uh, idea that had very much to do about three-dimensional space. So we were looking at ideas of depth, density, and ideas of foreground and background. So, we, we think the work is best when you, when it has something to reveal when you get close. So you might see something, we, we, we hate when a project is just kind of a one-liner. You see it and you get it and when you get close, the detail is horrible. And so what these drawings allows you to think about like is what happens up in the foreground of the, pro, of the drawing and then how you might work to the background of the drawing. 
Uh, we also think about thickness and line weights and how that might be built into three-dimensional space, but all of the lines are continuous. So just, I mean, if you imagine this is drawn uh, with very little pencil overlay, underlay, um, it's all ink. And if you draw a line across, you can't actually draw all the way across because you have to predict that there's a line from the back that comes to the front and make a knot, right? So you, you would have to leave, you, you would have to three-dimensionally understand this knotting of space before you can draw it, which I actually think is quite a, a, an accomplishment. And then as over time, we start to think about um, the bundling and also, in fact, uh, different figures coming into, um, into the line work because at some point we'll also realize that we can't design all of our architecture through lines. But we did develop a, a set of projects. Um, this was one that I was showing you the kind of technical drawings earlier, but this is a, a ceiling project made of uh, aluminum tubing. And as a, as, a, as a young practice, the first seven years, we did something like 12 installations. And I, I think those were wa our way of investing into the ideas that we were interested and thinking about how to actually pull off this type of geometry. So all of these were fabrication that we did ourselves. Um, this was um, a staircase that we did uh, for the Sire Gallery. But also the, thinking about um, you know, a project like this, this was probably like a structural engineer's nightmare because um, we told them that we wanted to use aluminum, which is very soft, and um, we want it to be one inch, which is also structurally not quite significant enough. But also as a way to work with a consultant, um, we thought about um, instead of usually, you know, you have a problem, and then the structural engineer tells you this building's gonna fall down or it's, it's not stiff enough. And then uh, instead of just accepting kind of what the parameters they gave us, we thought, he, they said, we really need three inch pipes instead of one inch. So we came up with the idea of bundling. So we actually put, we welded three one inch pipes together to create the same uh, kind of stiffness, but then it actually added to um, the look and the density that we wanted. So. This was uh, um, also a, a, this is probably our earliest project, um, is a, a kind of 23 foot uh, cantilever made of rope and, um, rope and aluminum tubing. And this was an interesting project where we, I mentioned I, we were collaborating with an artist uh, who had a relationship with uh, the Muhammad Ali family and there was an idea about a kind of perceptual reading. So if you see the bottom, this where the kind of cone, there's a cone of vision that you might see something at the end. Um, but we uh, hung 1,300 speed bags. So you know those bags you, you um, the boxers use, and then it makes the face of Muhammad Ali at the end, but only at one one perspective. And so everywhere else you understand it as this kind of field of bags. Um, which was a very interesting kind of revelation for us is that, you know, at some people that they all, all they care about is stand at that point, take that picture and then walk away. But I think there's enough people that wanted to actually understand more how it works. And it was something we didn't know if it, were, it was going to work because, you know, obviously our eyes, we have two eyes, not one. And also it's, uh, you just don't know if it's gonna look real enough when you do it. So until you really do it. And then this was something we also, we model in digital space, but when you model something in digital space, there is no idea, like there's no uh, depth. Everything is so flattened, so it looks perfect in digital space, but you just, you really don't know until you do it. And I'm glad it kind of worked out, but. And this was a piece we did like um, right in downtown LA across where the Lakers play. But this perceptual idea of like having something you get, like, like I get, I understand a pattern, but as a kind of 
something to understand from really far away. And then as you get up close, something else happens. It's, it's something that we've been playing with for a while. So this is a piece that uh, just uh, been acquired by uh, SF MoMA in their permanent collection. It's about 20 feet wide by eight feet tall. Um, it's also made of uh, rope um, and um, aluminum. And this is a piece that um, when there's actually a bench in there, and once you sit on the ben bench, you, you see a kind of void that um, goes deep into the entire system that you didn't, it didn't reveal itself when you see it from far away. So I mentioned like, so first 10 years, first five years, you know, we did a lot of uh, line type <coughs> installations and, you know, we realized architecture, sometimes you got to make some enclosures and, um, and then we wanted to think about ideas of surface. That's not just basically the lines become a frame for a service, for a surface, but how they can start to have a loose fit relationship where sometimes the lines start to become dominant or sometimes the, the surface becomes dominant. And so we, we, for every kind of topic, we start to think about how, like things that we work on in the office. Um, you know, for the last 14 years, we've you know, always been teaching alongside that we've been practicing. And sometimes it might be a thing that we work on in a seminar that you know, we introduce and then we take it and we develop it further in our office. So a lot of these models are things that we've been just been thinking about a lot for a long time um, as an office in the project. So as an office project. Um, and, you know, it, it also led to a lot of these projects where they become um, sometimes cladings uh, of a building and, um, thinking about uh, this was for uh, a client called IAC, the same client that designed the Frank Gehry building um, in New York City. 
and but for a kind of uh, a smaller project in LA and wanted to kind of redefine the brand but through um, but without changing the like without changing the existing building so we propose this kind of screen that undulates and then as it kind of um, flies up to flies down to the moment where there's a lower uh, restaurant the <coughs> the structure starts to reveal itself um, and then um, so there was surface and then lastly the idea of volume I think something that's been um, something we've been currently working on um, are a series of these models we call uh, active inlays. And, um, you know, we like to think of our office as kind of a research that we do uh, both in terms of the small scale things and medium to the large scale. So we produce these models. Um, uh, there are, uh, the wood pieces are a uh, kind of triple sometimes double flip mill pieces <coughs> with the whites, the white pieces that are a, um, a 3D printed, but um, they are in parts. So even thinking about how you might assemble something with different technologies, and uh, as you understand how flip mill works, um, you would have to make sure there's no undercuts, and then how do you slip one piece, and then the assembly might force you to slip one piece, put the wood together, and then add the, third, the, the 3D print piece later. So ideas about joinery. So you'll start to see that um, there's piece, pieces that have, we start to design how seams might work. But the whole point of the, the, in, the inlay project was just the, if you think about something that's inlaid into something else, you think of it as something really thin. It's like a kind of surface change. Um, and what we thought is like, what if it is not actually something thin? What if we play with the idea that something that's thin could be very thick from other perspective, or it has a kind of deeper sectional quality? So all of these play with that perception um, of, of the uncertain thickness. And even so, as mentioned, there's ideas about uh, on top you start to see these kind of it, like sort of surface um, uh, inflections that are actually just ways that we create joinery. And then sometimes we make models that are like kind of like the x-ray version of um, another piece. So you might see something where uh, if, oh, sorry, like something where it, it shows that this is actually a thin thing, but this, this might imply that this thing goes deep all the way through, but in here you can see that they're separate. So these are the kind of inflections that we're, we're interested in. And, and then um, a lot of these kind of research and models that we just do in our office leads to uh, ideas of uh, projects that we work on. So um, about uh, now, maybe eight years ago, we started working on, uh, we started going to Asia and Taiwan specifically. Um, this is the site of our, our high rise tower. And we went to a bunch of developers like, and trying to convince them that, you know, okay, the biggest thing we've done is an installation, but you should give us a high rise project. Um, and, you know, we did a bunch of these proposals. Uh, this is one of them. Here's another one. And, you know, in, I like to show these because sometimes you, you realize that architecture is hard, not because, you know, there's a lot of technical things you got to learn, but also just like when you figure out how to do one thing, like an installation, and then you have to jump scale and work on a big building, you realize like things don't translate. Like a line is not a line as an installation might be a tube, but a line in a big building should not be a scaled up tube. Like that's just not right. But you know, we had to do it. So it, it, it was a kind of period of um, exploration and working at a much larger scale and understanding how we might be able to jump scale as a small office and think about how we work on this problem. So 
So maybe about three years later, we somehow convinced um, a developer and a really great one to give us this project. Um, and so these are a fairly high-end, um, high-rise, re residential high-rise. And when, they, when you think about, uh, especially in Taipei, uh, these are the kind of sort of the two conditions of what uh, residential high-rise. One side is the kind of cookie cutter, um, sort of stacked, uh, exactly the same. Sometimes strange styles like Art Deco and Victorian creeps into the, the high-rise designs. And then the other side is um, what happens several years later when people, when they don't quite work for people and they start adding on to it. So we really figure like, let's figure out some way to bridge this, these two conditions, these, these two such drastic range of, 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 of types. And um, so this is the site. Uh, it's a, um, a project that is, um, has a, it's, it's a really amazing site. It has, a, it's next to an elementary school. It's across from a middle school. And then on one side is an elevated highway. So what we understood is it, it was a volumetric problem that it will not ever be blocked on three sides of the building. And so we wanted to, it's not an infill project. We wanted to make sure it doesn't really like there's three separate facades. So, um, you know, we, we started with, like, we really um, love the kind of vibrancy of, of Taipei. We wanted to think about ideas of creating variation, but somehow our, our developer said, okay, here's a floor plan, that's it. And so how can we design something? And then they said, okay, so uh, front of the building where you have the balconies, you get about five foot of space. The size to do some sort of variation, and the side of the building you get about at most one and a half to two feet of space. But make it look like it's all integrated and not like it just tacked on. Um, and so after doing so many of these uh, proposals, we realized just the kind of scaling up of, of, of members of a literal line wasn't quite the right thing. And thinking about how to start to, uh, to layer relationship, layer uh, materials was something we, we were um, exploring. So, and then also the, the idea of the line was a strategy, not a set line. So a lot of these became how we can reroute the line because as we start to develop uh, the project, we realized there are so many things we didn't, we had no idea was going to be an issue. There's feng shui, there is, you know, you can't block the living room, but you can block the bathroom, you can't block, you can halfway cover a, a study but not you know there were just and then so we had to like basically set a, a very kind of lengthy rules about how how we can cover these panels and we also um, convinced the developer that this is also a great idea because it helps with um, just the heat in this it's so hot there um, it blocks light um, and convinced um, the developer, and even with the city, um, you know, we, we, we wrapped every single corner with these, pa uh, these panels, and what happens is, like, it, they had a hard time getting permit because basically the city says, well, if you make an enclosure, someone's gonna put a floor, floor in it, then they're gonna go in and hang stuff and use it as a balcony and things like that. And they had to, like, convince the city that wasn't gonna happen and so that we can actually uh, properly permit this project. And a lot of, so at the end, um, it, it really required a, a huge uh, leap of faith on the part of the developer to allow us to do something that they've never done before. There was uh, no panel that are the same. We use um, clear glass, expanded metal, fritted glass, and then there's also every uh, metal, um, piece, um, frame is different, um, which at the end, um, because it was so, um, such a challenging project, uh, it, like we thought we were going to go through about DD and hand over the drawings and it was gonna be done, 
but the developer wouldn't let us because they thought if they mess with one panel, the whole design's gonna go wrong and they don't wanna be responsible. So we were pretty much designing all the way till the last day of CA, so, which was great because then we had full control, a lot more, like a, too much work, but it was amazing. So yeah, so final, final thing. And then to completely uh, switch gears to a, a, a project we just finished um, last year. Um, this is in the city of Columbus, Indiana. How many of you have been there? How many have been to the exhibit Columbus? Uh, how many of you seen our project there? Maybe one, two, couple of you, yeah. Um, so uh, Columbus, Indiana is a, such an um, amazing example of what a great, um, small town, what an industry could do to a, a city. So what happens is this uh, Cummins Diesel, uh, they uh, started this foundation, I think in the 50s, um, and they basically said, we'll fund uh, all of your architect's fee, any project in this city, we'll fund your architect's fee as long as you pick from our list of architects. And their list of architects was like Errol Saarinen, I'm Pei, like all the kind of famous people. So this little town of 40,000 people has something like 70 noteworthy buildings, four Pritzker Prize you know, uh, winner buildings in there. So really quite amazing. So we were asked, um, but they felt like some, some certain members of, this, of the city felt like you know, the list needs to be updated, that there's newer thinking about architecture. So we were um, invited um, last, last year to um, basically propose, they invited 10 architects and narrowed down to five. And each architect has to do an installation next to kind of a master's building. So this is a bank by Errol Saarinen. Um, and so like, it's really hard to put a project right next to like an Errol, Errol Saarinen bank. And so we, and without like, you know, how do you start to understand what he's doing, but without completely just doing what he was doing. So we were looking at things that really interest us. And so like in the moments, the actual left is, is the interior of the bank. There's these kind of uh, half domes that are, have this kind of mysterious glow, mysterious glow of light. And what he does in um, both also in the middle side, the Miller house where the, the column goes up to the point where you think the roof is gonna come and where the weight should be distributed. It, he does this cross where then like the kind of, this, the typical structural load, an understanding of the load disappears or same as this um, the condition at um, the airport where the column actually goes through and then pulls away so you don't see the moment of the connection. So we, we like that kind of mystery of how things work in his projects. We also love just the kind of finer details of um, you know, these kind of frames and the ideas of the stair um, in his work. So we proposed, um, so the, the space is, um, so the bank had three existing canopies. So if you see, the kind of where the reveals are, there's three existing canopies, um, and that's where the tellers, um, people used to drive through them, and that's how you get money. Um, those were existing, and we thought, instead of, we were less interested in doing kind of a, just a piece of sculpture, but we wanted to be an, a piece of architecture that people can occupy. So we, we reused those canopies and then created two, um, two L's, so two L's around it, and incorporate it into our design. What we realized, and we kind of knew this was gonna happen, is that those canopies over like time have, there's not a single thing that was actually vertical or straight or, so we did a full, we had to do a full uh, 3D scan of the entire site and so that we can build it off site in Los Angeles um, and then have it match perfectly on site, which was insane. Um, so, um, 
So then you can see what we did was we play with this kind of the active inlay idea. One side is this kind of filigree frame with um, a solid object embedded. On the other side is a solid frame, a solid wall with the kind of frame object embedded on the other side. And then there's kind of a moment of transition. Our son thinking he's fabricating. Um, and then this is also something we built it entirely. Um, and just to say a few things about the build process, th these are like six months, kind of every day, all day kind of thing. Um, this is probably one of the, the hardest ones we've done. And we've always said to ourselves, we will we'll keep doing it as long as we learn. We, we're doing something new at each of the installation. And we're, if we're not learning something new, we don't want to do it. So um, here we're working on also welding. We've never created uh, compound surface objects that are fully welded um, in steel. But what we realized is as we had to transport this whole thing to Columbus, Indiana, none of these pieces actually are, there's nothing square. So we had to hang these into in its own crate um, so that we can actually stack it. And in fact, uh, we had to rhino model the entire two semi trucks. That's what the, the two blue. And then we fit every piece in there perfectly, like in the two semi trucks uh, with about six inches left at the end. And the whole build, um, and you can just see kind of the scale of how large some of these pieces are. Um, so we took, I said, between four to six months of uh, planning and building in Los Angeles. And we were there, and I think we put up the, the entire thing in about three days, which was, and just crossing our fingers that it was all gonna fit, and it actually did. So you can just see, you know, and then there were also challenging things as, uh, as we work, I know, definitely different than uh, working in your backyard. Like every time we climb a ladder, we need someone watching us climbing the ladder. And there were a lot of rules uh, working there. And then also some of the, the frame pieces. Yeah, and some final, final images. I think I would just, just to close on this project to say uh, the thing that people was, I felt like was the best compliment was um, some of the locals, especially there was one guy that uh, actually worked in the teller and they was just say, he was just saying like, it just felt like it was always there, but it's something completely new. So I, I thought that was such a, such a great, great compliment. Okay, uh, last project. So you've never seen a 3D printed food, that's this is what it is. So the story behind this is uh, a, a couple of Cyrix grad students, um, when they were uh, finishing, uh, when they were in school as a way to kind of make money, they used to 3D print, like they had an old Z Corp machine, and they 3D print stuff for students on the side. And one day they had an idea that they had, a, had to go to a birthday party, and they were like, well, what if we print, like 3D print a, a thing on top of a cake? And then so they took all the powder out, they put in sugar and used water as a binder and uh, created what to be a kind of first 3D printed sugar printer. Um, when they graduated, they went out and they, they, they got a patent for this and then they got bought out by 3D Systems, kind of the biggest company, 3D printing company in the world. And then they, um, are now working for as a tr creative director of, of this company. And so now they're uh, 
creating the first, of course that was a very like crude version of a, a food printer, but you know, food printing is, I mean, the kind of, um, let's say, regulations involved in like producing a, uh, like a food production machine is so immense. It's taking many years for, to get every kind of label to, to, like it all works, but it's like, you know, is this food safe? Can you like, you know, because people are gonna eat something from this. So basically while they're waiting for getting all the kind of approvals, they wanted to invite chefs to come into the space and like experiment. Cause like these are, you know, really expensive printers, maybe hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand, fifty to hundred thousand dollars printers. And you know, no one really understand, like most chefs have no idea what a food printer is and they would never sell them if no one knows how to use it. So, um, so basically they started this space, they start to collaborate um, with, um, with uh, chefs and then they'll show you like, you can make this. And so there was one of the dishes, like they made a French onion soup, but the crouton was make, made of onion powder and then they pour the kind of hot soup and the whole thing melts and it was like amazing, right? Um, and then uh, the space, they, the, so they, they were actually our students at SciArc and then uh, when they had this idea, of, they have this company, we're gonna design an amazing space for them. That was kind of a tall order. And they had uh, just acquired this space, which is a bank. And this bank had, um, on the top, you see it has this huge vault that was concrete. It has 18 inches wall, 18 inch wall that was not going to be removed. So, and then we had to make um, a, a sort of food safe manufacturing space. So it was completely sealed in glass. That's where the 3D printer is. And then the kind of front space is a test kitchen, uh, event space for where um, they were going to showcase the printers, collaborate with chefs and whatnot. So um, here are some working on, um, and this was a space where um, we worked with a contractor. Um, most of the, the project was built um, by a contractor, but the kind of handrail, the very specialized handrail system um, was something we produced. So we replicated the entire footprint of the mezzanine uh, in our backyard. So you can see the platform. And then we built that whole thing uh, in our backyard. Perks of being in LA. Um, and then they were also in, in chunks and that then we can reassemble uh, in the space. And just, just to like kind of last thing to say about this project was, it, you know, it was one of those things also to think about when you're working with you know, now we're working so much with digital fabrication and, um, you know, this one we use uh, CNC bending, uh, also just the more kind of now traditional digital fabrication like milling and, um, and what we realized even when we first built the frame and we had these like, I think we had a company that CNC bent all the tubes and we had, had a semi truck, 23 of these like noodles that came to our our, um, our office and then they were supposed to be within like something like an eighth inch of precision. But then they left like some between six inch to a foot extra of space. So you don't really know where the perfect section of your piece is within that. Um, so we had to, if you can see here, we had to figure out how to set it in place, but all the in-between vertical pieces were hand cut steel um, and just the process of doing both kind of digital and then the hand, uh, hand cut and welding. By the time we were ready to put in these um, CNC milled uh, fins, the wood pieces, we knew it was most likely not gonna, going to fit. So we uh, did an entire test on cardboard and realized every single piece was off. So we had to then take our cardboard templates set it in, reshape it, re-input in the computer, and then did that like three times. 
So that was like kind of like people always think, oh, it's so easy. But when you change technologies, change materials, things are, you have to understand these processes all have kind of tolerances and you have to understand that. So, so some final, final shots of the, the piece. But then at the end, it, it, it turned out um, quite beautifully. And last video. I'm happy to take a few questions, if there are any. Yeah. Danny, let me pass the mic to you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's for the recording. It's for the live online from here. Mm -hmm. How did you get the meeting with the Taipei developers? <laughs> uh, a lot of cold calls um, and just um, approaching them. I mean, people always will meet with you once, and you know. But I think it's it has to do with just being persistent and like not not being afraid if they close the door on you, but just keep trying. Did you show up for by design or just? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, one thing I have to say is, uh, you know, in in Asia there was there's always this thing, and maybe this is true elsewhere, but. We never, we, 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 we're insistent that we don't work for free. So like sometimes they always say, oh, just do us a quick, stick, quick sketch, you know, like we'll like, and then they're like, you know, and then you don't hear from them ever again. But I think we, even if it's a little bit, we insist on getting paid. And I think when you do that, it, they take you more seriously and they actually look at the design that you propose. Anything else? I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. I'm thinking about um, how you began to frame, you know, continuing to say the first five to ten years of your practice around installation work, and you were talking about drawing, and now looking at how involved you are in all of the projects, how drawing um, seems like I can imagine how your drawings are loaded with so much interesting experience and information, even a simple line drawing now refers back to all of these really unique installation scenarios. And I'm thinking about how, as your projects begin to scale up and, and translate into um, more contractor type scenarios, like how that drawing enterprise translates to second, third, fourth kind of parties. I mean, that's a, that's a really good question, and it's always the thing that, you know, maybe because in the beginning we're so terrified of giving up that control, 
that we just kept doing it and doing it all the way to the end. But I think that it's, it's about, um, I, I think at some point, because of your own kind of base knowledge of what you know, like, I find that now, just like when we were working on um, the culinary project, the culinary lab project, because we're building on that thing, and then we're building that thing on the side, and they were so kind of impressed by what we can pull off that, in fact, it made, it kind of motivated them to do much better, or like they kind of approached an issue with a different kind of mentality than a normal contractor would be. Um, so I think it's, it's, it may not translate totally, but it's, it's more like you lead by example. So if, um, if you can show how you would do it and you hope that they would have the kind of same, like, um, I mean, even in the tower, it was, it was quite amazing because, you know, at some point I would go to the job site and our, our contractor was apologizing. He's like, I wish we had, this is like, this is actually really fun because they're so used to making the same kind of cookie cutter buildings. And they were telling me, oh, this is like, I wish I had more time to work on this because this really required an extra six months that we didn't have. And we're, we're trying to do this as, like really fast, but they were all really proud of it. So, um, you know, you hope that you hope that at the end, the design will transcend and motivate them. And then last thing is uh, when I think there was a project we did for the Beijing Biennale, like if it, and also the kind of, it was like a hybrid uh, installation in a building. We, instead of sending them drawings, we sent them YouTube videos. <laughs> Uh, of how we would rope something, how we would build something, and in fact, that was how they got things done. So rethinking how you might present the work is also important. Thank you very much. I um, have a question. You said something that I thought was really interesting about how your work has been some by accident and some by design, the different opportunities that have come. And I'm curious as you sort of look back on what you've done over the last 14 years and kind of anticipate or look forward, are you hoping to continue to have a balance of the kind of by accident, by design, or do you see your sort of practice taking a more formal approach? Um, I definitely think, I mean, even us doing, like you think by the time you're more established, there's less accidents, but, um, you know, even the work that we're doing for the city of LA, that was kind of an, how we got brought on was a bit of an accident. And then we realized like, that's something that's really cool. And we wanted to work more on that type of work. So now we're really now by design pursuing more of that type of work. So I, I, I mean, I hope we can keep doing this because, you know, we do think because we do such a wide range of projects, um, we never know who might have a kind of crazy idea that want us to do something different. So that keeps it interesting for us is to be able to explore our ideas in different scales. Anything else? Okay, thank, thank you. you.